Chapter 13, The Test of Faith. This chapter is based on Genesis 16, chapter 17, 18 through 20, chapter 21, 1 through 14, and chapter 22, 2 through 19. Abraham had accepted without question the promise of a son, but he did not wait for God to fulfill his word in his own time and way. A delay was permitted to test his faith in the power of God, but he failed to endure the trial. Thinking it impossible that a child should be given her in her old age, Sarah suggested, as a plan by which the divine purpose might be fulfilled, that one of her handmaidens should be taken by Abraham as a secondary wife. Polygamy had become so widespread that it had ceased to be regarded as a sin but it was no less a violation of the law of God and was fatal to the sacredness and peace of the family relation. Abraham's marriage with Hagar resulted in evil, not only to his own household, but to future generations. Flattered with the honor of her new position as Abraham's wife and hoping to be the mother of the great nation to descend from him, Hagar became proud and boastful and treated her mistress with contempt. Mutual jealousies disturbed the peace of the once happy home. Forced to listen to the complaints of both, Abraham vainly endeavored to restore harmony. Though it was at Sarah's earnest entreaty that he had married Hagar, she now reproached him as the one at fault. She desired to banish her rival, but Abraham refused to permit this, for Hagar was to be the mother of his child as he fondly hoped, the son of promise. She was Sarah's servant, however, and he still left her to the control of her mistress. Hagar's haughty spirit would not brook the harshness which her insolence had provoked. When Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. She made her way to the desert, and as she rested beside a fountain, lonely and friendless, an angel of the Lord in human form appeared to her, addressing her as Hagar, Sarah's maid, to remind her of her position and her duty. He bade her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Yet with the reproof there were mingled words of comfort. The Lord hath heard thy affliction. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And as a perpetual reminder of his mercy, she was bidden to call her child Ishmael, God shall hear. When Abraham was nearly one hundred years old, the promise of a son was repeated to him, with the assurance that the future heir should be the child of Sarah. But Abraham did not yet understand the promise. His mind at once turned to Ishmael, clinging to the belief that through him God's gracious purposes were to be accomplished. In his affection for his son, he exclaimed, O that Ishmael might live before thee! Again the promise was given, in words that could not be mistaken, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him. Yet God was not unmindful of the father's prayer. As for Ishmael, he said, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him a great nation. The birth of Isaac, bringing after a lifelong waiting the fulfillment of their dearest hopes, filled the tents of Abraham and Sarah with gladness. But to Hagar, this event was the overthrow of her fondly cherished ambitions. Ishmael, now a youth, had been regarded by all in the encampment as the heir of Abraham's wealth and the inheritor of the blessings promised to his descendants. Now he was suddenly set aside, and in their disappointment mother and son hated the child of Sarah. The general rejoicing increased their jealousy until Ishmael dared openly to mock the heir of God's promise. Sarah saw in Ishmael's turbulent disposition a perpetual source of discord, and she appealed to Abraham, urging that Hagar and Ishmael be sent away from the encampment. The patriarch was thrown into great distress. 
How could he banish Ishmael, his son, still dearly beloved? In his perplexity, he pleaded for divine guidance. The Lord, through a holy angel, directed him to grant Sarah's desire. His love for Ishmael or Hagar ought not to stand in the way, for only thus could he restore harmony and happiness to his family. And the angel gave him the consoling promise that though separated from his father's home, Ishmael should not be forsaken by God. His life should be preserved, and he should become the father of a great nation. Abraham obeyed the angel's word, but it was not without keen suffering. The father's heart was heavy with unspoken grief as he sent away Hagar and his son. The instruction given to Abraham touching the sacredness of the marriage relation was to be a lesson for all ages. It declares that the rights and happiness of this relation are to be carefully guarded, even at a great sacrifice. Sarah was the only true wife of Abraham. Her rights as a wife and mother no other person was entitled to share. She reverenced her husband, and in this she is presented in the New Testament as a worthy example. But she was unwilling that Abraham's affections should be given to another, and the Lord did not reprove her for requiring the banishment of her rival. Both Abraham and Sarah distrusted the power of God, and it was this error that led to the marriage with Hagar. God had called Abraham to be the father of the faithful, and his life was to stand as an example of faith to succeeding generations. But his faith had not been perfect. He had shown distrust of God in concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, and again in his marriage with Hagar. That he might reach the highest standard, God subjected him to another test, the closest which man was ever called to endure. In a vision of the night he was directed to repair to the land of Moriah, and there offer up his son as a burnt offering upon a mountain that should be shown him. At the time of receiving this command, Abraham had reached the age of a hundred and twenty years. He was regarded as an old man, even in his generation. In his earlier years he had been strong to endure hardship and to brave danger, but now the ardor of his youth had passed away. One in the vigor of manhood may with courage meet difficulties and afflictions that would cause his heart to fail later in life when his feet are faltering toward the grave. But God had reserved his last, most trying test for Abraham until the burden of years was heavy upon him, and he longed for rest from anxiety and toil. The patriarch was dwelling at Beersheba, surrounded by prosperity and honor. He was very rich and was honored as a mighty prince by the rulers of the land. Thousands of sheep and cattle covered the plains that spread out beyond his encampment. On every side were the tents of his retainers, the home of hundreds of faithful servants. The son of promise had grown up to manhood by his side. Heaven seemed to have crowned with its blessing a life of sacrifice in patient endurance of hope deferred. In the obedience of faith, Abraham had forsaken his native country, had turned away from the graves of his fathers and the home of his kindred. He had wandered as a stranger in the land of his inheritance. He had waited long for the birth of the promised heir. At the command of God he had sent away his son Ishmael. And now, when the child so long desired was entering upon manhood, and the patriarch seemed able to discern the fruition of his hopes, a trial greater than all others was before him. The command was expressed in words that must have wrung with anguish that father's heart. Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Isaac was the light of his home, the solace of his old age, above all else the inheritor of the promised blessing. The loss of such a son by accident or disease would have been heart-rending to the fond father. It would have bowed down his whitened head with grief. But he was commanded to shed the blood of that son with his own hand. It seemed to him a fearful impossibility. Satan was at hand to suggest that he must be deceived, 
For the divine law commands, Thou shalt not kill, and God would not require what he had once forbidden. Going outside his tent, Abraham looked up to the calm brightness of the unclouded heavens and recalled the promise made nearly fifty years before that his seed should be innumerable as the stars. If this promise was to be fulfilled through Isaac, how could he be put to death? Abraham was tempted to believe that he might be under a delusion. In his doubt and anguish he bowed upon the earth and prayed as he had never prayed before for some confirmation of the command if he must perform this terrible duty. He remembered the angels sent to reveal to him God's purpose to destroy Sodom, and who bore to him the promise of this same son, Isaac. And he went to the place where he had several times met the heavenly messengers, hoping to meet them again, and receive some further direction. But none came to his relief. Darkness seemed to shut him in, but the command of God was sounding in his ears, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. That command must be obeyed, and he dared not delay. Day was approaching, and he must be on his journey. Returning to his tent, he went to the place where Isaac lay sleeping the deep, untroubled sleep of youth and innocence. For a moment the father looked upon the dear face of his son, then turned tremblingly away. He went to the side of Sarah, who was also sleeping. Should he awaken her, that she might once more embrace her child? Should he tell her of God's requirement? He longed to unburden his heart to her, and share with her his terrible responsibility. But he was restrained by the fear that she might hinder him. Isaac was her joy and pride, her life was bound up in him, and the mother's love might refuse the sacrifice. Abraham at last summoned his son, telling him of the command to offer sacrifice upon a distant mountain. Isaac had often gone with his father to worship at some one of the various altars that marked his wanderings, and this summons excited no surprise. The preparations for the journey were quickly completed. The wood was made ready and put upon the ass, and with two men-servants they set forth. Side by side the father and the son journeyed in silence. The patriarch, pondering his heavy secret, had no heart for words. His thoughts were of the proud, fond mother, and the day when he should return to her alone. Well he knew that the knife would pierce her heart when it took the life of her son. That day the longest that Abraham had ever experienced, dragged slowly to its close. While his son and the young men were sleeping, he spent the night in prayer, still hoping that some heavenly messenger might come to say that the trial was enough, that the youth might return unharmed to his mother. But no relief came to his tortured soul. Another long day, another night of humiliation and prayer, while ever the command that was to leave him childless was ringing in his ears. Satan was near to whisper doubts and unbelief, but Abraham resisted his suggestions. As they were about to begin the journey of the third day, the patriarch, looking northward, saw the promised sign, a cloud of glory hovering over Mount Moriah, and he knew that the voice which had spoken to him was from heaven. Even now he did not murmur against God, but strengthened his soul by dwelling upon the evidences of the Lord's goodness and faithfulness. This son had been unexpectedly given, and had not he who bestowed the precious gift a right to recall his own? Then faith repeated the promise, In Isaac shall thy seed be called, a seed numberless as the grains of sand upon the shore. Isaac was the child of a miracle, and could not the power that gave him life restore it? Looking beyond that which was seen, Abraham grasped the divine word, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 19 Yet none but God could understand how great was the father's sacrifice in yielding up his son to death. 
Abraham desired that none but God should witness the parting scene. He bade his servants remain behind, saying, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. The wood was laid upon Isaac, the one to be offered. The father took the knife and the fire, and together they ascended toward the mountain summit, the young man silently wondering whence, so far from folds and flocks, the offering was to come. At last he spoke, My father, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Oh, what a test was this! How the endearing words, My father, pierced Abraham's heart. Not yet. He could not tell him now. My son, he said, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. At the appointed place they built the altar and laid the wood upon it. Then with trembling voice, Abraham unfolded to his son the divine message. It was with terror and amazement that Isaac learned his fate, but he offered no resistance. He could have escaped his doom had he chosen to do so. The grief-stricken old man, exhausted with the struggle of those three terrible days, could not have opposed the will of the vigorous youth. But Isaac had been trained from childhood to ready, trusting obedience, and as the purpose of God was opened before him, he yielded a willing submission. He was a sharer in Abraham's faith, and he felt that he was honored in being called to give his life as an offering to God. He tenderly seeks to lighten the Father's grief and encourages his nerveless hands to bind the cords that confine him to the altar. And now the last words of love are spoken. The last tears are shed. The last embrace is given. The Father lifts the knife to slay his Son, when suddenly his arm is stayed an angel of God calls to the patriarch out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He quickly answers, Here am I. And again the voice is heard, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Then Abraham saw a ram caught in a thicket, and quickly bringing the new victim, he offered it in the stead of his son. In his joy and gratitude, Abraham gave a new name to the sacred spot, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. On Mount Moriah, God again renewed his covenant, confirming with a solemn oath the blessing to Abraham and to his seed through all coming generations. By myself have I sworn, saith Jehovah, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice." Abraham's great act of faith stands like a pillar of light, illuminating the pathway of God's servants in all succeeding ages. Abraham did not seek to excuse himself from doing the will of God. During that three days' journey, he had sufficient time to reason and to doubt God, if he was disposed to doubt. He might have reasoned that the slaying of his son would cause him to be looked upon as a murderer, a second Cain that it would cause his teaching to be rejected and despised, and thus destroy his power to do good to his fellow men. He might have pleaded that age should excuse him from obedience. But the patriarch did not take refuge in any of these excuses. Abraham was human. His passions and attachments were like ours. But he did not stop to question how the promise could be fulfilled if Isaac should be slain. He did not stay to reason with his aching heart. He knew that God is just and righteous in all his requirements, and he obeyed the command to the very letter. 
Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. James chapter 2, verse 23. And Paul says, They which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. But Abraham's faith was made manifest by his works. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? James chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. There are many who fail to understand the relation of faith and works. They say, only believe in Christ and you are safe. You have nothing to do with keeping the law. But genuine faith will be manifest in obedience. Said Christ to the unbelieving Jews, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. John chapter 8, verse 39. And concerning the father of the faithful, the Lord declares, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis chapter 26, verse 5. Says the Apostle James, Faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. James chapter 2, verse 17. And John, who dwells so fully upon love, tells us, This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Through type and promise, God preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the patriarch's faith was fixed upon the Redeemer to come. Said Christ to the Jews, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he should see my day. And he saw it, and was glad. John chapter 8, verse 56, from the Revised Version, the marginal reading. The ram offered in the place of Isaac represented the Son of God, who was to be sacrificed in our stead. When man was doomed to death by transgression of the law of God, the Father, looking upon his Son, said to the sinner, Live, I have found a ransom. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel, as well as to test his faith, that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. No other test could have caused Abraham such torture of soul as did the offering of his son. God gave his son to a death of agony and shame. The angels who witnessed the humiliation and soul anguish of the Son of God were not permitted to interpose, as in the case of Isaac. There was no voice to cry, It is enough. To save the fallen race, the King of glory yielded up his life. What stronger proof can be given of the infinite compassion and love of God? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Romans chapter 8, verse 32. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. The field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. Because Abraham had shown a lack of faith in God's promises, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant, and as unworthy of its blessings. God desired to prove the loyalty of His servant before all heaven, to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted, and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Heavenly beings were witnesses of the scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, 
but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his fidelity. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. God declared to his servant, Now I know that thou fearest God, notwithstanding Satan's charges, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. God's covenant, confirmed to Abraham by an oath before the intelligences of other worlds, testified that obedience will be rewarded. It had been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption, to comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for guilty man. When the command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. With intense earnestness they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. When to Isaac's question, Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham made answer, God will provide himself a lamb. And when the father's hand was stayed as he was about to slay his son, and the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption, and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12.